All right, come on down, guys and ladies. It's good to uh, have you all here, and I hope you have a great time. Man, oh, man, great group of kids going down. Amen. Give them a hand. This is exciting to see. All right, we have some more coming. All right, very good, very good. My friends, what a good day, amen? Man, we get to sing praises to the Lord. We get to see and be a part of a, a great time with the baptism. And man, then we get to share in His Word. It just, uh, I don't know how much better it can get, amen, than what we've already experienced today. But God bless you, and thank you all for coming and tuning in with us at home. And Today I want to continue with my series of messages entitled, Connecting to Serve in 2021. I've been talking to you about connecting to God. That is our first and most important connection we can have. Then I've talked to you about connecting to the local body, the church, that we can minister through the church. And then I've been sharing test, uh, messages with you now about connecting to people. Because God wants us to connect to the world. And God wants, has given the church the task of reaching people for Jesus. Amen? That's what we're called to do. And we're to, to connect to them. And the title of my message today is, Whatever It Takes. That, my friend, should be the mindset of the church. That whatever it takes to reach someone for Jesus, we should be willing to do it without any exception. We should be willing to do whatever it takes. Paul writes about this in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And I want you to turn your Bibles there as we look at this text of Scripture. As Paul is going to be talking about uh, what it means for him to reach people and what he's willing to do to reach people for Jesus. Now I'm going to have in this message a statement as part of my message. The first thing is a statement about this text. The second part of my message is going to be a question that I'm going to direct to you, to direct to you at home, to direct to you as individuals, but also for us as a, as a church. So I have a statement. And then I have a question I want to close up with, okay? So if you have your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting at verse 19. If you're able to, would you stand with us in honor of reading God's Word this morning? Now, the Apostle Paul is writing here, and, and he's talking about And last week, as you remember, I shared with you about a message of freedom. That we are free in Jesus, and we even sang that song a few moments ago. That when Jesus sets us free, or we are free indeed. So Paul is going to start off with this. He's going to preface his statement with that fact. So let's go ahead and read. Verse 19 says, For though I am free, again, there's that freedom, I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all. He said that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law as without those who, uh, those who are without law and without law not being without law toward God but under the law toward Christ that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men. There's that statement, willing to do whatever it takes. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Father, we come to you today. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. God, we thank you for your salvation. And thank you for this time that we've been able to just sing praises to you. And what a powerful, powerful praise time we've had. And Father, I pray that it has been used to uh, focus us so that now as we look into your word, that, Father, we can, can receive it and be doers of it. And, Father, I pray that as we continue on in this time, that you would speak to our hearts. Father, we love you and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Thank you. Please, please be seated. Today, what I want us to do is... We all love to say, and I believe all of us here today would love to say, I want to be a part of a church and that I personally would be willing to do whatever it takes to win people to Jesus. Just like what Paul says here, that we would love to say it. Amen? As a matter of fact, it would be powerful to say it. It would be kind of popular in the church to say it. And it would really win some points if you were able to stand and say, I would do whatever it takes to win people to Jesus. 
But I would dare say, my friends, that when we make that statement, that we got to be really careful. Because I would dare say that there are a lot of cases where that's not necessarily true. Now, we would like to do a lot of things to win people to Jesus. I'd be willing to do certain things to win people to Jesus. But I'm not sure that I would do whatever it takes. Because this whatever it takes means just that. That we're not limiting God in any way, any shape or any form. That whatever God leads for me to to do, I would be willing to do it as long as someone has a chance to come to Jesus. Because I believe again, many and myself included at times would love to say, man, I'd, I'd do a lot. I'd do a lot. But I don't know if I do whatever it takes. That's what we're going to look at today. And I want to make a statement about this text that I believe is really being taught in the church today in a wrong way. I believe that there are churches who are taking hold of this statement, this text of what Paul is saying. And my friends, they're using it in the wrong sense. And what I mean by that is this. I believe there are people who are taking this text... And if you will, they're often abusing it by by being able to justify for themselves compromising Christian standards and compromising the the law of, of the Word of God in order to witness to the lost. So some are saying, in order for me to win people to Jesus, I've got to set aside my own personal convictions about the Word of God. I've got to set aside what it actually says. I've got to, if you will, water it down just a little bit so that it will be more palatable to the lost people. And in other words, whatever I've got to do, if I've got to go out and I've got to act like the lost world, well, then I'll act like the lost world as long as I can have a chance somewhere in there to tell them about Jesus. My friends, can I tell you the truth that that is a lie from Satan that he'd be trying to get the church to say, hey, Do whatever you want to do. You must look like the world, act like the world, talk like the world, sing like the world. Do everything like the world because if you don't, the world will not receive you. As a matter of fact, if you'll remember last week, if if you were here or you tuned in, I shared with you about this freedom, about how the world is wanting us to take a plea bargain with this freedom. That we're not going to, we can be free, but we're not going to really present it out. They will leave us alone. They will not restrict us if we'll just keep our mouths shut. But in order to be heard by the world, there's a lot of people who are standing in pulpits even this morning telling and leading their congregation into saying, we need to be like the world. We need to be accepting of the things of the world so that we can have an opportunity because if we are not like that, the world won't listen to us. Well, I want to encourage you today with this. We must not... Let me say it again. We must not compromise our morality or our Christian ethics. We must not. So they misinterpret when Paul says, I become all things to all men. He's not saying that I became like them and I did everything like them. I acted like a lost person. I talked like a lost person. I I was involved in lost people's activities. And man, I was getting in tight with them. And I was looking, acting, sounding just like them can I tell you if you do that it's going to be really hard to win someone to Jesus because you know what question they're going to ask you when you present Jesus to them why do I need him because you're acting just like me there's no difference between us we cannot do this as a matter of fact Jesus has if you will in his scripture Jesus has drawn a definitive line to say There is a distinct difference between my people and the world. And this is one of them. He says, we are not of this world. John 15, 19, he says, you are in this world. The phrase is, you're in this world, but you're not of it. In other words, he says, this is not your home. Hey, Christian, can I tell you that old song that we used to sing years and years ago? This is not my home. I'm only passing through. Y'all remember that one? Well, that's exactly what we are. This is not our home. We are not of this place. We are not to be like this place. We are not to be emotionally attached. He says, do not store up for yourselves 
treasures on this earth. In other words, don't be so involved with this world. Don't think you've got to include everything in this world. He said, because this stuff is temporary. It's not going to last. It can be stolen. It can be broken. It can be torn away. It can be uh, decaying. It can be broken. Do not hang on to the things of this world, but store for yourselves treasures in heaven because let me tell you something, we are meant for heaven. Amen? Amen? We as Christians are meant for heaven. So Jesus said, you are not, not, not of this world. There's a line. The second thing that he says is we are the salt and the light. Salt and light means that you add flavor and you give direction. You give purpose. Listen, that's who we are. And if I'm like the world, if I get involved in all the worldly stuff and I talk like the world, act like the world, and do everything like the world, then I can't be different. I'm not going to be salt. But I also can't give direction when all I'm doing is acting like the world. The world ought to be seeing something different in us. They ought to be hearing something different from us. The way we act to things ought to be different. The way we react to things ought to be different than the world. Jesus said, man, you're the salt and light. I'm I'm distinguishing between you and the world. This other one, the world hates me or hates you. You know, before it hated you. So he says, you can't, listen, he's saying you can't get along with the world. If you stand on godly principles, the world is not going to like you. You want to prove it? Try it. Go to work. And that doesn't mean that you've got to stand up and stand at your desk or whatever and yell out, Hey, everybody in here, I want you to know that I'm a Christian. We shouldn't have to do that. They should know it again just by the way we are, the way we act, the way we walk, the way we talk, the way we present ourselves. There There ought to be a difference between us and everybody else. Jesus even said, I'm going to draw such a distinct line here and I'm going, to, I'm going to blow your mind with this statement. And there's a lot of people that this scripture really blows their mind when they hear it. Because we, we've got this idea of Jesus as being the unifier. Jesus brings us all together. And we all get along because of Jesus. Jesus said, hey, do you suppose that I gave, came to give peace on this earth? He says, I tell you, not at all. He says, but I rather came to bring division. And he goes on and explains the division. But what he's saying is, he said, there has to be a difference between you and the world. I didn't come that you can get along with that. I didn't come that you can act like that. I didn't come that they can now come in here and act like they want to act and be what they want to be. And you have to accept everything that goes on in this world. He says, that's not why I came. I came that you would be different. So when he's talking about becoming all things, all people, the folks who tell you that it's okay to be whatever you want is is not true. John 3 tells us this. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. He says the world loves darkness. They want it dark. They, they like the darkness. They like things then because their deeds are where they don't want to be exposed. But he goes on and says, for everyone practicing evil hates the light. Okay, Jesus is the light. Didn't he say, I'm the light? And you know what else he told us about the church? Didn't he tell each one of you and me that we're the light of the world? Right? So he says that this lost world hates what? Light. So if Jesus is light, they hate Jesus. If we're the light of the world, the world is going to hate us. Because we are not going to go along with everything that the world says. Folks, if we're going to stand on Christian standards and principles, can I tell you, we can't accept the things of the world. We can't. Because we're the light. The light doesn't have any fellowship with the darkness. Because the darkness hates the light. But you notice it didn't say the light hates the darkness. We're to love the people. But that doesn't mean, and here's what the world is lying to you and saying, that if you don't agree with what I'm saying and doing and living and all that, then you hate us. 
That's not true. Jesus died for them. He loves them enough to die for the world. He died for me when I didn't want him. So we don't hate the light. He says that they, they, do the, they hate the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But what's going on today in our world? What's going on in our churches? John MacArthur put it this way. Look what he said. He said, evangelicalism seems to have been hijacked by legions of carnal spin doctors. He said, there's a lot of people who are hijacking the, the evangelical church. And what he's doing, he says, they are trying to their best to convince the world that the church can be inclusive, pluralistic, broad-minded, as the most politically correct worldling. John MacArthur says what's happening in the, in the church today is there are people who are trying to get the church to look so much like the world that we could be counted as the world. And we're not living the way God wants it. said that we're now claiming that we're all inclusive. Everyone can come and be in, in, in this. Be who you are. That we can be pluralistic. In other words, that you, if you like Jesus, fine. But if you don't, that's okay too. Just come. He's saying that you can be broad-minded about all the things that are out there. Man, just be opened up. Think about the possibilities of all you could get if you'll just accept this stuff that's going on in the world. Bring it in. Be accepting because that way you're going to have an opportunity. And he said that way we can be just like the world. Can I tell you, my statement is, again, this is not what the Apostle Paul was talking about. It's not what he said. We cannot be accepting of, of sin. We cannot compromise what the Scripture tells us. And to be like everyone else, we must make a stand. We must be different. And people must be able to know that we identify with Jesus. Listen, Paul would never have engaged in any loose sexual behavior to reach people for Jesus. He had never, never gone out and acted and, and broken any of, the, of, of Jesus' words to them. He had never done that in order to, if you will, accommodate an unbeliever to make them feel better around him. He wouldn't have done that. But he said, man, I'll be there for them and I'll help them. And I believe that firmly that Paul was saying what he accommodated himself to the unbelievers, but he worked with as far as he could go in his conscience without breaking his conscience and without breaking the covenant of God. So that's what the church needs to be doing. We, we, we need to understand, church, that but God's word confines us, not in a bad way either. It gives us a guideline. It gives us a purpose. It gives us a place that this is how you can operate. And we need to be willing to do anything inside there to operate, to bring people to Jesus that we need to be doing, that we could possibly do, again, without going to, to the worldly ways. So I told you, there's my statement, but then I have a question. A question to you, are we truly willing to do whatever it takes to get people to Jesus? Again, we can say we are, but are we really truly to do everything? And I want to ask you that. Are you willing are you at home willing to do whatever it takes, despite the obstacles? Can I tell you a lot of times there's an obstacle in our path that keep us from reaching people for Jesus? And can I tell you, most of them are made by us. I create my own obstacles. And I don't want to get out of those obstacles. Man, those obstacles, I place them there for a reason, to make myself feel protected, to make myself feel like, okay, here's a reason why I'm not, and I justify why I'm not doing what God calls me to do. And so I place an obstacle in front of myself, and I keep it to myself, and I use it all the time. But we have made these up ourselves, maybe our own ideas, maybe our own philosophies. Are you we willing even despite our inconveniences? Hey, can I tell you that bringing people to Jesus is not convenient at all? Man, you have to go out of your way. It's not convenient to at all times be ready and willing to do whatever God calls us to do. Because I, one thing I found out is there's a lot of times God will call us when we're least expecting it. I'm not prepared. 
And I may not even, listen, here's the thing that we've got to understand. I may not even at that moment be wanting to do what God wants me to do when he calls me to do it. My case in point was, uh, many of you know that I spent 17 years as a teacher in this public school systems, and I was a girls basketball coach for 17 years. When in about year 14, God began to burden my heart about doing whatever it takes to reach people for Jesus. And what he was wanting me to do is he was wanting me to step out of that and become in, be in the full-time ministry as a preacher. Now, I'll tell you what, I wasn't ready for that. When God began to call me that, I wasn't, I wasn't over in my classroom. I wasn't in my gym looking at my team and playing basketball and coaching basketball going, Oh, Lord, I can't do this anymore. You've got to get me out of this. These girls are driving me nuts. Okay, now I have said that. That I've said many times. Hey, I even say that in my family, man. I got three daughters and a wife. Oh, Lord, these girls are driving me nuts. Okay, so... Okay, I, so I lied. I did say that sometimes, but I wasn't saying it with the idea of get me away from them. As a matter of fact, when God began to call me and wanted me to do whatever it takes to win people to Jesus, I began to debate God. I began to tell him what a good coach I was, what a good youth director I was, how many young ladies and guys that I'm getting to talk to about Jesus. God, don't you see? Man, don't you see how you're messing everything up if you pull me out of this? But God said, no, I want you so folks, can I tell you, even as the pastor, I'm going to tell you that there are sometimes some inconveniences in our lives when he tells us to do something, to reach somebody for Jesus. How about despite the cost? Despite what it costs us, that digging deep into our pockets and giving to the ministries and giving to the workings of the church so that we can have the things that we need to do so that we can draw people to Jesus. Can I tell you, my friends, reaching people for Jesus isn't cheap. It's not free. The things that you're going to see for Bible school, Falls Creek, none of that was free. And we don't have grants to apply for, praise God, wouldn't do it anyway from the government to help us fund this. You know who funds all that we do? You do. Now listen, don't get mad and say, oh, there he goes, that's a pre tied the methods message. No, it's not. I'm just laying it out there that we want to say I'm willing to do whatever it takes as long as it doesn't cost. But there's a cost not just financial, but there's a cost in your time and your energy, your effort. I mean, it costs something. So are we willing to do it even despite the costs? So then we look and we say, okay, what do we do? Well, for individuals, for all of you here, for all of you at home, for the individual, here are some things that, that I need you to understand. In order to, to reach people for Jesus, that if he tells us to reach people, if we're going to be reaching our neighbor, guess what we got to do? Be a neighbor. God, if you call me to reach my neighbor, I, I want to be a neighbor. I, I promise you, all of you probably, unless you live out in the middle of nowhere, you probably, and even then, you got your first or second neighbor on your road is going to probably not be churched. We all have neighbors in our neighborhood that are not going to church anywhere, that do not know Jesus. In order for you to be a neighbor, to reach people for Jesus, to reach your neighbors, you got to be a neighbor. That means you got to go find out about them. You need to know their names. Man, you need to have be, be involved in their lives. Oh, now, preacher, you know, you just don't know. It's hard for me. Well, if you're going to reach your neighbor, are you willing to do whatever it takes? How about to, be, to reach your friend? To reach your friends, you know God, what you got to do? You got to be a friend. To, be a, to reach my friends, I got to be a friend. Means, in other words, you got to open yourself up to people around you so that you can talk to them, talk to your friends, and be friendly to them so that they will trust you in what it is that, they're, that you're wanting them to hear about Jesus. So are you willing as an individual to reach your friends? Well, to reach your friends, you got to be a friend. To reach your community, guess what you got to do? you got to be a part of the community. We, we can't reach the community if we never get out in the community. If we lock ourselves away and we're never out in public to to be a part of what's going on, then folks, we're never going to reach our community. So individuals, if you're going to 
do all things to all people, then you must be a good neighbor that tells people about Jesus. You must be a friend that tells your friends about Jesus. And you must be involved in the community. Again, be all things to all people for the chance of saving some. Now about the church. I'm closing up here, so get ready. For the churches, for us as the body, we got to understand to reach children, you know what you got to do? We got to do children's style of activities. Amen? We got to do what kids enjoy. We got to be a part of it. And, and listen, you might be saying, well, I don't enjoy all that. Well, so what? It's not for you. I'm going to get to your group here in a minute. But in order to reach kids, we got to do kid stuff. We got to do things that are going to draw kids to where they, believe it or not, you can make your church, I know that's going to be hard to believe, but you can make your church where they actually say, Mom, Dad, I want to go. I want to go to that. Amen? I want to go. I want to go to that movie time. I want to go. I want to go up to, to the city. I want to, man, they're going to this today. They're going to have that at the church today. Boy, I want to go. Hey, listen, one thing I found out about parents and kids, if the kid wants to go badly enough, you know what's going to happen? That kid's going. That parent will get that kid there. So in order to reach the kids, though, the church has to be built to where we're doing children things. Hence, Vacation Bible School coming up. That's why we put so much effort into it. That's why we put so much money into it. That's why we do everything that we possibly can to make this under God's leadership where kids will come and say, wow. Because if they say, wow, they're coming back. So if we're going to reach kids, we've got to be doing kids' things. If we're going to reach students, guess what? we got to do student-styled activities because students need to want to come to here as well. And in order to do that, you got to be doing student stuff. You can't just hang out and do nothing. you got to have a focus on the students. That's why, hence, tomorrow everybody's loading up and going to Falls Creek. Many of you might say, well, I don't like going to Falls Creek. Okay, because it's not for you. As well, I was joking, say, man, if you haven't been to Falls Creek in years, Man, this, 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 False Creek ain't your, your, your dad's False Creek anymore. It looks different than what it used to. Some people go down and go, oh, I don't think I like this. Well, yeah, I probably not, but it's not for you. It's for the students. Now, listen, I want you to know, False Creek isn't compromising the gospel, because if I thought they were, or they were, they were going away from, from what I believe the, the Bible tells us to act and conduct ourselves, I promise you, I wouldn't let our church go down there. But False Creek is doing that. But so First Baptist West. Everything that we do, needs we need to have our students involved and in doing things because that's going to make them want to come. So if we're going to, be, if we're going to win students to Jesus, guess what we got to do? Student-styled activities. If we're going to win, reach families, you know what we got to do? We got to, re, we got to do fam, family-styled ministry. You remember a couple years ago when Doug retired, our music minister retired, and, and he moved to Norman. If you'll remember, man, God began to burden my heart. And I, I, I asked you to begin to pray about the new person that we're bringing on, man. That I really felt like God was wanting us to do a two-fold hire. One was going to be that this person needed to do choir and be great at choir. And, and because I believe choir is a ministry of First Baptist West. Amen. It's a great ministry. People are involved. And listen, I think if you even think about choir, you need to be involved in the choir. Because it's a great, great ministry. So we needed that. But the second thing you remember, I told you, church, we need to be praying about a man that could come and lead what I want to call our family ministry team. That we can open up and we can do family-related activities. And praise God, he sent us Patrick. Amen? He sent us Patrick. And I promise you, Patrick is doing a great job with this ministry up here. Amen? Man, if you've been a part of that or you're, you, you're listening, you know that it, he's been doing a great job. But he's also doing a great job with our family ministry team who is, man, they're knocking things out of the park with family-related ministries. But you got to do it. Because if you're not built to bring families in, guess what? You're not going to bring families. If you're going to reach young adults, you got to do young adult-style activities. If you're going to reach senior adults, you got to do senior adult-related activities. You've got to be ministering to 
everybody. You gotta have areas focused on all of these groups because these groups are all included into the ministries of the church. Now you say, well now pastor, wait a minute. I can't do all those. You're not asked to do all of those. You don't have to be involved in the children's ministry. As a matter of fact, some people say, I don't like being around kids. Well, then I don't want you in the children's ministry at all. Amen. If you don't like being around students, please don't volunteer to go to Falls Creek. Please don't volunteer to go anywhere. If you're going to just be an old cranky pot the whole time you're there and whine and moan about the students acting like kids, because you know what? That's what students do. So if you don't like students, no. But how about families, young adults, senior adults? Man, we got a whole lot of ministries going on at First Baptist West. And my friends, they're all needed for us to be as First Baptist West, be willing to do all things for all levels and groups of people with the hopes, with the hope that some might be saved. So if we're going to do that, we've got to be willing to do it. So as individuals, are we truly willing to do whatever it takes? As a church, are you, here's a member or a person who attends First Baptist West, are you willing to let the church do whatever it takes to reach people? Listen, it may not be for you, but don't let that be an obstacle. If it's scriptural, if you can look at whatever the church is being led to do and it's scriptural, you know what you need to do? You need to be a part of it. Don't object to it. Don't fight it. I told you weeks ago that God is burning my heart and there's to be some changes coming. Well, guess what? In the next couple of weeks, you're going to start hearing some of these changes. And I want to ask you, are you willing to do what you believe God is calling us to do within the confines of Scripture to be able to open up the chance to reach people for Jesus? Paul says, to connect to people, you got to be willing. you got to be willing. So here today, I want to encourage you, do you know Jesus? I want to encourage you, if you don't, or you're not sure that you do, man, I want you to receive him into your life today. He died for you today. Would you come and receive him? Maybe you're at home, and you feel that emptiness in your spirit, and you feel that, that loneliness, and you feel the need, then that need can be filled with Jesus Christ. Call upon his name today. Maybe you're here, and you say, Pastor, I, I want to be a part of reaching people. I want to be willing to do whatever it takes in my own personal life and whatever I have to do in the life of this church to reach people for Jesus. I want to be a part of that. Man, here in just a moment, I'm going to be praying for you, praying over you, and that you would surrender yourself over to God and say, God, here I am. Use me. Change me so that I'm willing to do that. Lord, I've been so restrictive on your calling. I've, I've said I want to do certain things to reach people, but God, I'm not willing to do everything. Would you please allow me to take down that burden, take away all those barriers, and God, let me do what I need to do to reach people for Jesus. Let me be willing to do what the church needs to do that I can see us reach people for Jesus. Because, my friends, that ought to be what we want here at First Baptist West, reaching people for Jesus. Mm. You want to talk about something happening and something exciting. Let that happen. But we've got to first be willing to do whatever it takes. Would you bow your head and pray with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you today and we thank you for your love and grace. And God, as we enter into this time, I pray, Lord, with all my heart, if there's someone here or someone watching this program, and Father, they don't know Jesus as their Savior, I pray today that you would call them, call them to salvation, Lord, and they'd be willing to know in their heart that they received you into their life by seeking forgiveness of their sin, claiming you as the Lord of their life, Lord. I pray that they would do that right now. And Lord, if they're not sure that maybe they'll, they'll call the church or maybe those who are here in the program, Father, they would come and, and, and I could pray with them and pray over them and guide them, encourage them to receive Jesus. But God, also pray for those that are here today that you would speak to us as individuals to guide us to be willing to do whatever it takes. That we might have to break down some of our own barriers or allow you to break them down so that we can surrender ourselves to you, Lord, to do whatever it takes. Father, I pray 
for our church that we would be willing to do whatever it takes over these next weeks, months, and years. That your leadership would guide us to do whatever it takes to win people to Jesus. And Lord, let it, let it start today. Let's start tomorrow when they go to Falls Creek. Lord, let us see a movement of your spirit. Let us turn ourselves to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask you to stand. as we're going to...